It's a very, it's a difficult thing because when you ask it, you get asked a question like, "What's your favorite anything?" Like, "What's your favorite film?" My yeah. mind goes blank. Yeah. What's your favorite food? My mind's going blank. Um, so my mind goes kind of blank because the, you know, you find yourself in a business where, you know, you enjoy it, and so they're paying you for something that you like, which is, I think, uh, it's it's a pleasure that is denied to many. So, I think the whole thing has been a bit of a blast, one way yeah. or another. Um, but I suppose that when you look back very early on, when I realised that there may be a future for me in this business, it yeah. was very early on. It was my. It was when I was um, taken on as a BBC radio writer in 1978 with Rory, actually, yeah. and Guy Jenkin, who then went on to write "Drop the Red Donkey" and "Outnumbered" mm. and all those good things. And uh, we shared a broom cupboard at the end of the corridor of BBC Light Entertainment in Langham Place near Broadcasting House or near New Broadcasting House as it's called and of course when they rebuilt it a few years ago they demolished 16 Langham Street building yeah. so that's gone now but that department was quite extraordinary because it's a long corridor separated with a fire door and uh, this side of the fire door near the boss's office was full of very besuited respectable BBC producers and beyond the fire door was a bunch of new blokes and in the first office was Douglas Adams wow who was a terrible producer and was on the verge of leaving the business entirely and taking up a job in uh, in international exports in Hong Kong. Gosh. And he handed this script in to um, someone and said, look, I've written this script. I, I, I'm not sure about it, really. Because he tried to write on various TV shows like Doctors in the House and couldn't yeah. really get there because he had such an individual kind of way of seeing things, Douglas. Yeah. And, uh, and it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the radio series. Gosh which That's was then produced amazing. by Jeffrey Perkins, who was also on the corridor. So he wow. and Jeffrey got together and created, you know, what became an instant radio classic. So suddenly he's, he's on that path. And beyond him was a guy called John Lloyd, who was just about to go over to BBC TV to produce what he didn't know he was going to produce, called Not, Not an Eye O'Clock News, yeah. which is a pretty groundbreaking show. And next door to him was a man called Griff Rees jones who was a <laughs> producer. Um, uh, and uh, he didn't know within a year's time he'd be in have i got uh, he'd be in not the nine o'clock news yeah um then opposite him was jeffrey perkins and opposite next to jeffrey was the broom cupboard in which you would find on any given day rory mcgrath and myself and guy jenkin <laughs> and if you went there very early in the morning you may even find one of us slumped behind the door sleeping off a massive session um <laughs> so when i got into that department i kind of felt oh maybe there's a a, a future here for me because i'd I'd just left university. I've been at the Edinburgh Festival. Mm. I couldn't get a job. I was living in Catford and um, I'd signed on for a week, a week only. I signed on. I said to the lady at the employment exchange, um, I haven't got a job I'm, and I'm looking for a job. She said, well, what kind of work are you looking for? I said, I'd like to be a film star. She said, well, there's not much call for that round here in Catford. <laughs> they, they are looking for porters in Lewisham Hospital. <laughs> so I went to Lewisham Hospital and was a porter there for nine months. Wow. And then just various things happened. And I found myself now with this writer's bursary, which is a kind of starter kit for young people in our business um, mm. alongside Rory and, and Guy. And there I was doing that. And my first job was to write jokes for Frankie Howard. <laughs> and in a strange way, you know, sitting in an office with Frankie Howard there, a man who I'd watched on up, up Pompeii and having done, you know, brings it around to Chelmsford one, two, three in a way, because mm -hmm. Um, my Latin teacher, um, um, uh, who I've stayed in touch with throughout my life, really, or I, I got back in touch with him when I was 50, and we've been going off to do various archaeological holidays ever since. Um, he said to me, Watch up Pompeii, um, because this is in the late 60s, because he said the writer of up Pompeii is absolutely conforming to all the tropes of your classic Roman comedy he has all the stock characters in there he has the 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 cuckolded old husband the lascivious wife the stupid son and the wily servant who talks to the audience which was played by frankie howard so there i am with frankie howard uh, writing jokes of frankie howard and my father had just died and i remember one weekend frankie said i need a rewrite and we rewrote the script i want to read it over the weekend someone get it down to my i'm in somerset in my house in somerset I borrowed my girlfriend's car. I drove down with my mother who'd come down to spend the weekend with me because I was an only child and my dad had died. And so she came down to spend the weekend with me. 
I said, look, I've got to go and see Frankie Howard deliver a script, but you can come with me. He said, bring your mother. So I went down and um, uh, with my mum to Frankie Howard's house <laughs> in a strange village called Wavering Down, which is a perfect village if you've got Frankie Howard in it, because what he can do with the expression wavering down is no one's business. And we sat there in his garden and uh, his boyfriend, uh, which in those days was kind of very much under the, off the, you know, under the radar, mm. it's called Dennis, who's a lovely man called Dennis. And he was in his vest and he's in the garden. It's a beautiful summer's day. And we sat out in the garden and we had tea and Dennis brought us cakes. And all Frankie would do was basically say to my mother, I don't know how such a nice woman as you has got such a terrible son as this. And um, Frankie would always slag you off to your face because he said, I'm always nice behind your back. And that's a much better way to be. So on, on the way back, my, Dennis went off and, and gathered a dozen roses from my mum and gave them to her. And we drove back in the Mini. And she said, that's very nice. So who was Dennis then? I said, well, Dennis is Frankie's lover. What? I said, Frankie's boyfriend. They live together. They're kind of, you know, they're a couple. Oh, don't be silly. And I said, no, Mum, Frank, Frankie Howard is actually gay. He's, he's, he's a gay man. Oh, gosh, you say these things. And I don't know why you have. To. Anyway, so, you know, it, generation finds it difficult to speak to other generations, as I'm finding with my children. Um, so in a way, things like that for me were beacons because I was a young man. I was only 23, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. And just the idea, if you told me the year before that you'd be, you know, contributing to a script i mean rory you know is a very gifted writer he's just a brilliant writer and he he wrote a lot of the stuff clive anderson was the other writer and mm. i was the writer griff was griff Reese jones was the producer and the four of us uh he'd mock us all for our kind of uh you you boys went to cambridge and you don't know how to spend he he criticized our scripts for spelling he'd say things like he'd never laugh at one of our jokes and he said um you can't spell the word anger so we said, well, well how, how's it spelt there, Frankie? He said, you spell anger, A-N-G-E-R. That's not how you spell it. It's an awkward moment when the star of the show himself can't spell the word anger. <laughs> you went to Cambridge and you can't spell the word anger. Anyway, um, we, we kind of glossed over that because we didn't want to point out that actually he was illiterate. Um, wow. So I think that that's, it's stuff like that, really, a Barnaby yeah. that sticks in your mind, not the kind of, Oh, the, the, you know, the glossy TV series. There are things that you think, you know what? This might just be possible. Mm. And I think if you're young and you think things might be possible, it's very exciting. Um, I actually did produce uh, up, up Pompeii a couple of years ago um, a revival on audio. Did you? Yeah, there was a, a stage script that Frankie had commissioned that never got done. Wow! And years ago, I used to watch That's Love, which obviously you were in. Yes. And, um, I thought, well, that's not available on DVD, but it is on YouTube. So I've been cunningly watching the, uh, oh, really? the episodes. Uh, yeah, it's very good. It, it oh. holds up very well. But um, he died recently, Terence Frisbee, and he 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 uh, wrote he wrote well because he didn't write kind of gag gags. He wrote yeah. character lines. Yeah, that's what and was so you could really one. act. You know, they, they were real kind of. I remember I really upset him because I did an interview for the for newspapers and and they said, you know, what do you think? of the of the show so well like, what's interesting i said it's not like a it's not like a kind of conventional comedy show because all the jokes are kind of locked away in the characters and um he said that's a nice way of saying my scripts aren't very funny i said no it wasn't i really <laughs> meant that i meant that they yeah. you 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 have to rehearse them and then you find these moments where yeah that's really funny because it's genuine and it's it feels like it's authentic you know that's love seemed to me it seems like you're just listening into a normal conversation that's going yeah. on and, and you get the fun I, and I, I mean because i'm not a trained actor i had to make a choice thinking you know i one thing i didn't want to do is to embarrass myself or or indeed other people by overacting so you tend to kind of throw things away but i've always think it's i've always enjoyed com comic actors who do that rather mm -hmm. than uh, kind of they have an invisible gun at their head saying laugh at me or i'm going to kill myself Yes. <laughs> you feel like you're involved in some horrible kind of you know stockhausen syndrome with the comedian thinking <laughs> his life depends on me laughing at him how tense is that, that is, yeah thank Good. you for your enthusiasm and your passion and your persistence <laughs> yes <laughs>